Shout outs today to the people who made today's episode possible. First to Jim Temple, the grandson of Virginia O'Hanlon, who helps tell the story of the most well-known newspaper editorial ever written. And our thanks to young Lila Jackson, who provides the voice for Virginia O'Hanlon in her letter to the New York Sun. And to Dan Lefebvre, who gives voice to that New York Sun editorial. Lila happens to be the daughter of fellow podcaster Professor Greg Jackson of the History That Doesn't Suck podcast. This is the podcasting debut for Lila. And if Dan Lefebvre's voice sounds familiar, it may be because you've heard his podcast called Based on a True Story. I'd urge you to give our podcast friends a listen. Now to today's episode. I can say that I deal with news editors all of the time, and this story has always captivated me. Maybe it's because the writing is just so good. The journalist who wrote the editorial found a way to tell the complete, unvarnished truth about Santa Claus while preserving St. Nick's magic for Virginia. I hope you enjoy listening to this as much as I did in creating it. As always, if you have any thoughts or feedback, send them to me through email at tim at shapingopinion.com. And if it's easier for you, get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram at Shaping Opinion. If you want, we can give you a shout out. And as always, thank you for listening. You're the reason we do this. This is Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. Jim, do you believe in Santa Claus? Yes. This Santa Claus in, in spirit. It, it's hard to describe uh, the, the, the spirit of Christmas and Santa Claus changes in you as you uh, get older. When you're uh, very young, it, it's a, an exciting time, a time of expectation. And as you get older, you, that's put in your rearview mirror, and uh, you begin to understand what uh, Christmas r- really means. It, it, it becomes, I don't know how, how to say it, it becomes more religious. Maybe you recognize it as the, the birth of uh, Jesus and what that really means. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion Podcast, we're joined by Jim Temple. He's the grandson of Virginia O'Hanlon, who once wrote a letter to the New York Sun. Her letter would lead to an editorial that would cement Santa Claus in the minds of children of all ages for generations. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we'll talk with Jim about a now iconic editorial that features those legendary words, Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. The year was 1897, and an eight-year-old Virginia O'Hanlon had something on her mind. Her friends were telling her that there's no such thing as Santa Claus, no jolly old elf in a red suit, no eight tiny reindeer. Young Virginia decided to do her own investigation, so she wrote a letter to the New York Sun. Dear Editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. On September 21st, 1897, the New York Sun published its response in the form of an editorial that is now regarded as the most famous editorial in the history of American journalism. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant. In his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. 
He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist, and you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The external light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus, you might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus, but even if you do not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not, but that's no proof that they are not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Only faith, poetry, Love, romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world, there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God he lives and lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times, ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. The author of that editorial was a former Civil War reporter named Francis P. Church. Though he had no children of his own, his editorial was said to have captured the innocent essence of childhood, and he blended it with a complete non-condescending honesty. He wrote the truth, yet he never spoiled the magic of Christmas for Virginia, or for that matter, millions of boys and girls who would follow in generations to come. Jim Temple is the grandson of Virginia O'Hanlon, the once little girl who started it all and went on to a career as a school teacher and a school principal in New York City. My my first memories of her uh, are uh, when when I was a young boy. I lived in in Albany, New York, uh, and she lived in New York City. And she would come to, to the Albany area two or three times a year with her mother and they would stay with our family. And what I remember about those times was that uh, she was a magnificent storyteller. She uh, uh, would tell us, me and my sisters, these uh, stories uh, that she would um, make up and somehow weave us as characters in those stories. And there were, how can I say it? Uh, I had that memory, you know, stuck in the back of my head. And as I look back on that, she was uh, relating things that she had learned when she was a young child thinking back on on what it was like for her when she was young, the things that she told her stories about uh, were centered in things like uh, Ringling Brothers Circus and the wonders uh, of the world then that were part of the circus. Well, your grandmother lived in Greenwich Village, and from what I read, she loved baseball. She took pride in her appearance and fashion. She was a dresser. And as you said, she took you to your first movie. But her story is not all the stuff of Disney. Uh, She had uh, a husband for a short period of time, and he left her. They were married in 1913, and it wasn't long before she had a baby, your mother. And she never remarried after that. 
That's correct. I remember her home in Greenwich Village. It was on West 9th Street. And she lived there with my great-grandmother. It's a two-bedroom apartment, tiny little kitchen, bathroom, and a, a living room. The building had a doorman and an elevator. Uh, those things uh, seem, what's the, what's the word, almost like uh, magical. You know, you had somebody that opened the door for you, uh, someone that would call a cab for you, someone that would help you uh, carry your groceries. Uh. Mm -hmm. And she became a teacher then. She, she earned her Ph.D. in education from Fordham University. I found it interesting that her 1930 doctoral dissertation focused on the importance of play. Did you sense that she did much of that with you kids when you were younger, sort of applying what she learned as an educator? Yes, but I never thought of it as that. She would, I, I can remember back when my parents lived in Short Hills, New Jersey, and so I must have been five six years old the most then but my grandmother would come over and visit us and she would uh, take me on walks into uh, there, there were apparently woods there then uh, and I have I have a memory of that so she spent a lot of time with uh, with me the other things that I recall deal with her storytelling when, when your grandmother wrote her dissertation, she actually borrowed some language from that famous editorial that brought us here today. And I wanted to recap that because there were two people involved in this story. There was your grandmother, Virginia O'Hanlon, and there was Francis P. Church. And Francis P. Church was the person who wrote the New York Sun's response to your grandmother's letter. And it's been said that because he was a Civil War correspondent, he saw a lot of violence, and after the war, he was described as being cynical and reticent. So there was an editorial page editor at the New York Sun, and his name was Edward P. Mitchell. And he would later say that Francis P. Church bristled and poo-pooed the subject when I suggested he write a reply to Virginia O'Hanlon. But he took the letter, and he turned with an air of resignation to his desk. And that's where he wrote the New York Sun's response and it seems like the headline may have made all the difference when that editorial appeared because the headline was simply, Is There a Santa Claus? And that seems to have gotten everybody's attention when the editorial ran. There were some timeless excerpts from the letter. In the very beginning, the editorial starts with, Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They've been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except what they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. Are there any lines from that editorial that stand out for you, Jim? No, it's, it's the entirety of uh, that ed editorial. There's something in there for everybody, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu, there's nothing in there that should offend you. There's everything in there to give you hope. Well, there was another line in the letter, the one that is now the classic line, where Francis P. Church writes, Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life the highest beauty and joy. Did your grandmother learn from this letter and pass certain lessons from this letter on to her family? She certainly passed on the letter, what the letter said to her family. She felt a, 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 an obligation to always answer people's questions about that. I don't think she, I don't have any recollection of her preaching to me about what that letter says. What I do have a, a memory of is watching her conduct herself when asked about the letter she wrote 
and Mr. Church's editorial. What did she say? In, in exact words, I don't know, but the uh, letter that she wrote was not important. The editorial and what the editorial said uh, was the important thing. Now, your grandmother had obvious feelings about Christmas from the time she was a child. What were your family's Christmas traditions when it came to Santa Claus? I'm going to assume it's the same as everybody else. We really believed, and my parents do what all parents do at Christmas time uh, when they're celebrating Christmas. They encourage their children to believe. Did you celebrate on Christmas Eve or did you celebrate on Christmas Day? And what was Christmas morning like for you? We celebrated it on Christmas Day. As a young child, it, you couldn't sleep at night or the night before. Uh, great anticipation of what Santa Claus was going to bring. It was, I don't know how to describe it, it was probably the best day of the year. Well, there, there comes a time for every parent, you sort of dread it. And that is when your own children start to wonder about whether or not there is a Santa Claus. How did you handle it, Jim, when your children were starting to wonder if there is a Santa Claus? I don't remember exactly what we did, but I can tell a a story, a family story about one of my sisters and her husband, what they did. My brother-in-law was a a down-to-earth guy who would speak his mind. So it's time to tell their son that there really uh, was not a Santa Claus. And so they did that to their son, who was probably, I'm going to say, around seven, maybe eight, maybe nine. Anyway, my nephew takes that all in and starts to snivel. And uh, my brother-in-law can see that coming, so he, he doesn't want to see his child upset, says to him, now look, just imagine how it's going to look when you see a big six-foot bunny rabbit hopping across your front lawn that's crazy at Easter time. And my nephew said, you mean there's no Easter bunny (laughs) too? (laughs) So so, I I can remember vaguely, both uh, my son and my daughter asking my wife and I, you know, is there a a Santa Claus really? And uh, uh, we must have told them there wasn't. And I, so we must have been talking to both of them at the same time. And anyway, their their reaction, uh, primarily, I'm remembering from my daughter, is you're kidding us. You know, uh, there's got to be a Santa Claus. They were skeptical. As a member of Virginia's family, you spend a lot of time sort of making appearances and doing things like that. What's that like for you? It it feels, I'm obliged to do it. My my grandmother, my mother, never turned down a request to take time to uh, be interviewed or to speak to someone about this. And all of my sisters have the same mindset. In your house, are there any reminders of your grandmother's letter? Do you have certain uh, mementos and things like that around the house or... I know that you still have what you believe to be the actual letter. Is that your nephew that has that? Uh, That's right. That's the one who uh, got the bad news about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny at the same time. (laughs) And he he has the letter. But what type of Christmas decorations do you have around the house in December that remind you of of Virginia O'Hanlon's letter to the New York Sun? We have uh, several ornaments that go on the Christmas tree that are uh, themes uh, of that. We actually have a miniature copy of the editorial. It's a Christmas tree ornament. 
I, th- I think we even have a, a, an ornament uh, with a picture of uh, uh, my grandmother on it. So, yes. Does it feel surreal to think that your family has a connection to this when you see it in pop culture? I mean, there have been countless news stories about it over the many years and generations. There have been books and children's books. There was even an animated feature on television about it. Does it, how does it feel to you? Do, do, do you? do you sort of detach yourself from it and think about it as something that you can't relate to, or, do you, or does it mean a lot to you when you see those things? I, I, I have to say some of it, I don't care for the commercialization of some of the things that we see. It, it doesn't seem to me to be right to use this as a money-making venture. The theme of the editorial speaks for itself. People have asked me in the past, uh, why don't you copyright that? All I know is my mother and my grandmother didn't think that was right. They thought that was wrong. I I feel the same way. The editorial is what it is, and it should stand by itself, and, and, and no one should own it. Is there anything about that editorial that you think struck the nerve and why it's lasted so long in America's mind? Um, we all have pictures of uh, of Christmas, Christmas pasts, and, and gro- growing up with a, a belief in Santa Claus, and we've all experienced the excitement of Christmas doesn't make any difference whether you're rich or poor. Everybody has had that experience, and they've grown up through it and gotten to the other side where they're more mature. When you read that uh, editorial, it gives you hope. It gives you hope even as an adult. Yes. Well, I, I think your grandmother's words not only live on in so many ways, but there's even a more personal way that she lives on because she died in 1971 at the age of 81. And I thought this was a great story. She was in the hospital that December before she died, and there was a man by the name of John Harms, and he visited her at Columbia Memorial Hospital, and he was wearing a red Santa Claus suit. And he said he kissed her on the cheek, and he wished her a Merry Christmas, and she said to him that she still believes in Santa Claus at the age of 81. Uh, That's true. That's true. And she not only endeared herself to to her family, but she apparently endeared herself to people where she lived in her final years. She lived with her daughter in North Chatham, New York, and the community of North Chatham remembers her every year. What do they do? There, there's a uh, a gathering at the cemetery uh, in North Chatham where she's buried, where s- someone will read the letter that uh, my grandmother wrote, and uh, uh, someone reads Mr. Uh, Church's editorial, and then after that, they gather at, uh, at the local historical society's building, and share some Christmas carols and some cookies. They've been doing that for, I don't know, the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And that helps them get into the Christmas spirit and with their local connection to such a, an iconic holiday moment. If you had a wish right now for how future generations might see that letter from your grandmother to the New York Sun and then the editorial, what would your wish be, Jim? That. They see what I see and hear what I hear uh, uh, those words saying. It brings the thought of uh, peace. It, it, it shuts out uh, the chatter of things that aren't peaceful. I would hope everybody in the future could feel peace and hope when they read that letter, when they read the, the editorial. I don't see how, how it would be possible to have a different interpretation of that editorial. It, it, it somehow, using the language that we speak, resonates with everyone. 
the, the, the best example that I have is the interest that comes from uh, Japan. That society uh, in Japan is the history of Japan uh, is different than our history here. And the way that country has, has grown and the way our country has grown, different. Yet the chord that struck with the Japanese people about what that editorial says is amazing, just amazing. How do you see that? They show tremendous interest. Let's see, they sent a crew over here from NHK, which is their public broadcasting uh, system, and interviewed me. Another Japanese television show, a, a, a comedy with a clown, came and interviewed me. My mother experienced similar outreaches from Japan, and I actually get a Christmas card addressed to my mother from the, the people in Japan that came and spoke with her. So at least in Japan and at least in Europe, the editorial is, is being read and invoking curiosity. Jen, do you think that this letter will continue to resonate in future generations? Absolutely. I don't see how it, it can be otherwise. Jim Temple, thank you for joining us today. You're, you're welcome, and uh, we wish you um, a Merry Christmas. And the same to you, Jim. To learn more about Virginia O'Hanlon and the New York Sun's editorial about Santa Claus, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let people know by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion. Or you can get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook page and we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.